Hi, good morning, and welcome to another edition of Discover History. I'm Brad Bertelli, and we're here at the Keys History and Discovery Center. And today we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about one of my very favorite exhibits, Stories of the Upper Keys, which was probably one of the biggest, actually was the biggest exhibit that we had to put together here. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in, and Aaron, who is manning the, uh, the iPhone, will, will let me know. Otherwise, I will get back to you later on in the afternoon. Um, so, this is uh, Stories of the Upper Keys, which was, grew as the idea grew. It was um, trying to tell a large story over a short period of time, talking about um, a lot of the early communities in the Florida Keys, uh, in North Key Largo, um, Planter, which is of course the precursor to Tavernier and Rock Harbor, and then Matacumbi. So it was just, all right, here are seven panels, you know, do your, do your magic, tell, you know, tell a story. And it's one of the cool exhibits because the longer you spend looking at this exhibit, the more there is to absorb. I spent a lot of time putting threads of stories into the exhibit. So where some of the things are, that are on the first panel that you're going left to right end up on the, the last panel. Of, you know, there's, there's always tidbits that are kind of woven through. So today I wanted to kind of go through some of the panels and just um, talk about some of my favorite pictures and some of my favorite stories. So let's start up here in North, in North Key Largo. And of course you can't talk about uh, North Key Largo or Isla Mirada without introducing or talking about the fabulous Ed and Fern Butters who have a uh, tremendous history with the Florida Keys and a tremendous story with the Florida Keys. Um, they arrived 1926, uh, they were living in Miami and came over the bridge on a fishing trip. Like so many people who come to the Florida Keys, I came for a fishing trip, I came for vacation, and then came back because I never wanted to leave. This is what happened with these two. They ended up, um, Ed actually ended up building a little hotel on what's called Card Sound Road today, or, or, or Country Road uh, 905, um, uh, called the Key Inn, and this is where Fern Butters, who's, you know, world famous for her key lime pie, first started making her key lime pie and serving it in, in 1926. When, one day she was, um, they, uh, she bought the property, uh, which I've talked about in many times, didn't tell her husband, uh, surprised him at his job and said, oh honey, by the way, honey, we have a, we have a lot down in North Key Largo. Uh, his, his first answer was, is it above water or below water? Because that was, you know, in the 20s when the land boom was going on. But the, he built the Key Inn, which was a small hotel, and, um, and, and restaurant, and when she was out exploring the land, she found a kind of a wild key lime uh, grove, and ended up taking her uh, her you know her um, her apron and filling it up with key limes, and then came back and began to experiment with uh, her her world famous version of key lime pie, which um, she would never give the the total uh, recipe out to anybody. Always, always leave out some kind of a, some part of the a part of the recipe, but um, she would sell to Mabel Harris, and this is a picture of the Key Inn after, after it changed names uh, to Mabel Harris. Um, Mabel changed things up a little bit. Um, she bought it about 1931, and still there was a you know, warm bed to, you know, to, to sleep in for, for fishermen or, or people passing through. Still served great food at the restaurant, but also offered some other, other amenities that Fern and Ed did not. There was liquor involved, even during Prohibition. There was some gambling, you know, some, some uh, card tables there. And there was also some female companionship, if that was what you were looking for as well. What's kind of cool, you'll see this, this picture of this vine right here. That was a vine given to, uh, to Fern by Thomas Edison, who would frequently come to the Keys to explore. And he brought her a root that looked like a sweet potato. and. Um, said, just plant it, it'll take care of itself. Uh, so she, she did plant it, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, but it never flowered. And then, on the day that Thomas Edison died, the plant erupted in these lime-colored uh, lime flowers, that, um, which was really kind of a really cool in incident. And that was, that's a story told by Fern herself. Um, what we have here, this is the Anglers Club. And this picture was from about 1950. The Anglers Club, uh, which is still around today, it's a very exclusive club up in North Key Largo by the Ocean Reef. It was um, first uh, developed 
about 19, 1930, 1931, when it became known uh, as the Year Round Club, which was um, part of one of three uh, operations that, that were going. It was the Roni Plaza in, 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 um, in Miami, uh, the Biltmore in Coral Gables, and then also the English Club here in Key Largo. And these three clubs were connected, and if you stayed at one of the facilities, you were able to travel around and go to the other facilities. Now, because this was super exclusive and um, very, uh, uh, very for, for, for the well-to-do, um, in order to get down, there are three ways that you could come down to from uh, from the like the Roni Plaza in Miami. You could come down on a this is really a, a, a um, kind of a hotel room on wheels. It was uh, um, it was pulled by pulled by the uh, a car, and you could just kind of sit there and relax in this luxury this luxury uh, trailer, or you could arrive by what's called an auto gyro. And Doherty, who paid $15 million in 1931 for all three properties, paid $15,000 for that auto gyro. And that was kind of part helicopter, part, part car, part, part airplane, and it was able to fly at low speeds, and it was kind of the really, you know, kind of a cool way to travel in those days. I wish this, this picture was in uh, color because the auto gyro here um, is actually orange and blue, and it was named the Year Round Club, wasn't it? Was the name of, of the uh, of of, of the uh, um, vehicle would have been a really cool if you can imagine living in the Florida Keys or living in South Florida and seeing this blue and orange you know craft coming over in, you know, coming over the tree line going between Miami and 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 Key Largo must have been quite a sight. Uh, there's also a, you could also ride on what was called a sea sled, which was a kind of a um, a cabin on on boat that would travel between. Uh, Key West or Key Largo and and North Key Largo. Or, I'm sorry, in Miami. Now, what we also talk about a lot is how you know the Florida Keys are a farming community, and this was a uh, you know bananas, melons, pineapples, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, onions. Really, a lot of big variety of different kinds of, of, of fruits and vegetables that were grown. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, farmers picking up grapefruits after 1906 hurricane, and they picked up, or not farmers, but workers, they picked up thousands of, of, of grapefruits that had fallen off the, fallen off the, off the uh, trees, or had been blown off the trees during the hurricane. What's also cool, if you, look at the, if you look at this exhibit, there's more to, I mean, there's always something more to catch the eye. Even if you look down at the bottom, there are, there, there are more pictures in the back here that kind of give a, a better sense of, of the area. And if you're kind of wondering where you are mile marker wise, if you look down below, I'm not going to ask Aaron to, to uh, point the cam camera down there because everything will go upside down for a second. Mm -hmm. There's even mile markers down there to kind of give you a better idea, a better sense of where we're talking about. So Rock Harbor, this is, this is the, uh, Rock Harbor is the precursor to Key Largo. Uh, before the movie Key Largo came to town, the town was called Rock Harbor. So you couldn't send a postcard to Key Largo, Florida. You sent a postcard to Rock Harbor, Florida. And of course, after the success of the, uh, of the movie Key Largo, some of the uh, residents of the area signed a petition, a petition, I think there were like 500 signatures on the petition, to have the post office changed officially from uh, Rock Harbor to Key Largo. So if you had a letter or a, or a postcard sent, it would actually be stamped Key Largo, Florida. Um, home of the, you know, of the world famous Caribbean club. Now, this is a cool building. We talked about it several times. Uh, we even did a live Facebook live uh, chat there um, last year sometime. And that is, today is the Key Largo Moose Lodge, located about Mount Marker 98. Originally, it was built as the Rock Harbor Grammar School back in the 1920s. And this was a two-room coral rock building. There were two of them built at about the same time, the Rock Harbor Grammar School, and also the Matacumbi Grammar School, which was an identical building, the same, uh, I think there's a picture of it. There's a picture of it down here. I'll, I'll, we'll show you in a second. Um, but this one is still standing. The other one was destroyed. One in, in Matacumbi, uh, Matacumbi Grammar, Club, uh, Grammar School was on the upper, Matac uh, upper Matacumbi Key. Today, it's at what is today known as the property of the Chica Lodge was, of course, destroyed in the 1935 Labor Day hurricane, as was 
most everything in uh, the Adamrod area. This is a really cool, a really cool structure. It's the Garrett Observation Tower, and this was built. Um, it was operational in the 1930s. Probably, I'm not sure exactly when it was built. Um, this is no longer standing. Often, when I post this picture on uh, on Facebook, people always say, "Oh, that's the that's the that's the building on, that Wyland painted his uh, his uh, dolphins and, and whales on." And that building is at about mile mark 100 in the median. Um, this building was around mile marker 97, 98, and this was on the um, northbound side of the Overseas Highway. In those days, when th this building was was constructed, the northbound lane of what is today the Overseas, I'm sorry, the southbound lane of what is today the Overseas Highway was the area where the railroad traveled. The southbound lane, and back in these days, was the State Road 4A, which of course became. Uh, uh, the Overseas Highway, which opened up in 1928. And this was also a post office, but it was also one of the very early roadside attractions. So you could actually go up onto, you know, go up the stairs, up on top, and from the top there, you could look out around the, the, the small village of Rock Harbor and see mango fields and pineapple, I'm sorry, uh, lime fields and fishing nets drying in the, uh, drying in, in the sun. Um, but again, that, that building has been gone a very long time. Actually, the next time you're in the museum, if you look down below, um, one, one, one of the pictures that's kind of blue kind of blends in the background, and if you don't look closely, you'll miss it. But what's, the picture down below is actually kind of the aerial view of where this building would have been. So peek behind, always some really cool stuff that you can, that you can see. So let's move down a little bit farther to, uh, to Planter and Tavernier. Planter, we talked about, you know, a lot. This is the um, uh, called Planter because it was a again a farming community. Planter because they planted uh, largely pineapples and uh, other melons um, and tomatoes and onions and cucumbers, all the things that were growing so so fervently. Um, this was about this is around uh, where where Harry Harris Park is today. Also Ocean Point Suites. Mile marker ninety three, I think, is, is the general area. But this is on the ocean side. And again, there, the top picture you'll see, this is well, this, this was back in the 1880s, 1890s, turn of the century. And this, was, again, was before Flagler came to town or came to the Florida Keys. So if you look at that top picture closely, you'll see a lot of these long docks, these long piers extending out over the water. And this is where, you know, um, the boats, anything you wanted to come in or come out of the Keys, there were no cars, there were no trains, it was all boat traffic. And all these communities have these long piers going out because if you've been at the Keys, you know how shallow water is close to shore. So you have to have these long piers to get into deeper water that was more navigable for the uh, for boats coming in. This is a picture of the post office, also the grocery store. Grocery stores back in those days, not as you know, no Publix, no Winn Dixie, uh, just some dry goods basically uh, stacked up in cans and things, and, and these small buildings. This is a this is a come here. This is a really funny picture. This is one of my favorites because Aaron pointed something out to me that I got wrong for years and years and years. This building is still standing in Tavernier. This um, is started out as Harry's place or the, at the Tavernier Cafe, and for years and years I'm thinking, wow, they served raw fish salad. They served um, uh, ceviche at this at this restaurant back in the 1920s. And then Aaron pointed out to me, no, it's crawfish salad because this gentleman is standing before the sea. And I didn't realize that for years and years, which, which made me laugh. And um, you can see the picture. This is uh, looking down in downtown Tavernier in the 1930s. And some of these buildings are still there. You'll see this is, uh, this is the Tavernier, what, was, what would become the Tavernier Hotel. When this, in 1938, when this picture was taken, that was actually the Tavernier, um, that was actually a, a movie theater. You see there's no windows on the top. The following year, about 1939, um, the, the theater wasn't being, you know, wasn't being successful, so they redesigned it, put windows on the top, and it became the Tavernier Hotel. And that building still stands today. I believe it's currently empty and is being uh, renovated. Uh, from what I understand, perhaps some, um, some stores downstairs and apartments upstairs. But you can see the uh, Harry's Place over here. It says Turtle Steak on the, uh, on the awning. 
And this is the building that we just talked about. And then we have the tavern store up front here. And today this is Cafe Mocha, uh, which is a great place to get some pastry and some coffee. And actually before this building, oh, this was, this was, a, was the Key Lime Theater. Like, that could be wrong, because it could be this one here. I'm not positive. But still um, very cool to, to see these same buildings still, still there. This is a picture of Harry Harris, whose sister, uh, Mabel Harris, who first came down to the Florida Keys from Chicago in the 1930s, who bought Ed and Fern Butter's uh, Key Inn, who then renamed it Mabel's Place, who then began serving um, uh, hot meals and alcohol and, and, and doing a little gambling. And she actually wrote a letter home to her family in Chicago asking for help to come work at a restaurant, which is how Harry Harris ended up coming down to the Keys and worked and work for his sister for a while before he came down to, um, to the Tavernier area and began working for Matt McKenzie, delivering oil and, and ice to the individual houses around, around the community. He would end up running for a county commissioner, uh, served for a very long time, at one point was the mayor of, of Monroe County, and then at some point was uh, busted for accepting bribes, and then um, was uh, shortly thereafter was uh, pardoned. Um, so let's move down a little farther to uh, the next big community in the Florida Keys, uh, back, in, back in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, 19, 1930s, which was the um, then called Matacumbi. Today we call it, we look at it more as, as Isla Morada. Um, this is the original school for, for, um, for uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's the original uh, Matacumbi school, it also served as the church as well, a one room building. Um, basically in the area where De Leon Avenue is, kind of if, you, if you're at the Alvarado Post Office and we're looking out at the ocean, uh, the property behind there is where that building stood. It was eventually, that building was eventually moved down to, uh, the, down to, um, uh, to where the Chica property, the Chica Lodge property is today. In order to move it, the community got together and they placed a bunch of coconut palms on the ground and they rolled the building down to the water, got it in the water, put it between two sailboats or two boats and floated it down, down the beach. To, uh, to where it then was um, at, at the, um, at the uh, what was then the Pinder property um, will become a Chica Lodge. And that building was destroyed and then this two room coral rock building replaced it, just that's the sister school to the, to the um, uh, Rock Harbor Grammar School. And we see some, some people standing there and, uh, and sadly, that building was destroyed in the 1935 hurricane. This is kind of a typical, well, not, this was nothing typical about the Magic Comedy Club. It was um, built by 1919. It was for a select group of uh, men from the New York uh, Cotton Exchange, millionaires, they also called, called it the Millionaires Club. Very exclusive, uh, and it was a place where People, you know, from the north to come down and go fishing. That never happens today. Um, so that was kind of a novelty back, back in the time. And you, you could even, there, there was even, a, you know, the train would stop pretty close there, and you could dis disembark and, um, and, and come visit the club. So exclusive, as a matter of fact, that one of the members one day wrote an article in the newspaper about how great the bone fishing was down, down this area. And they banded together and tried to kick him out of the club for spilling, kind of, spilling the secrets of of, of, of the Millionaires Club, of the Matic Club, of the Matic Company Club, down in, in Upper Matic Company Key. And then um, we'll come down to, uh, to Lower Matic Company Key, where there was not a whole lot going on prior to the 1935 hurricane. Um, this was the area where the ferry terminal was. We've talked about this a hundred times before as well. You know, pre-1935, pre, -1935, pre uh, the Labor Day hurricane, the Overseas Highway was was built, it was op operational. You could get in your car in Miami, drive all the way down to Lower Matacumbi Key. At Lower Matacumbi Key, you would have to get onto a automobile ferry, and that automobile ferry would take you down, about a four hour trip, down to No Name Key. Once you got to No Name Key, you would disembark there, 
and then drive the rest of the way to, uh, to Key West. That wasn't a super successful, wasn't super reliable form of transportation. So they wanted to build a, um, a solid set of bridges that would have basically you know, paralleled the Overseas Railroad. Um, and so they brought in the World War I veterans and they had the work camps on Lower Matacumbi Key, uh, which are these pictures here of, of the work camps. Quite a scary place to be, considering that a uh, Category 5 hurricane, uh, a storm that to this day is the most powerful hurricane to ever strike North America, barreled across, which is um, why that job was never completed then. Uh, that, that, of course, that hurricane cost hundreds of lives, uh, both to the veterans who are working, as well as to a lot of, a lot of the locals. Um, and that was all that was pretty much going on at Lower Matacumbi Key back in those they, back before 1935, before the hurricane. After the storm, um, bridge construction, the bridge projects to build this complete because the railroad that storm destroyed the railroad, destroyed it was very compact, so the damage was very, pretty limited between like Tavernier and and um, Grassy Key. Uh, Pigeon Key didn't have anything. You know, affecting it again, you know, Key West. I think they had had had, um, um, had wind gusts about 32 miles an hour. So not much was going down, happening down the lower keys or even the middle keys and the upper keys. Complete devastation. Um, and then, so the, the railroad was was destroyed, or 40 miles of the railroad was, was destroyed. A lot of the bridges had been built so well that they withstood the tracks were blown off, but the bridges themselves withstood the hurricane. So instead, because the, because um, Flatter Railroad had largely become bankrupt and was on its way out anyways, the storm acted as really as the final, you know, the, the, the final nails in the coffin. And instead of rebuilding the train, uh, the tracks and the right of way, or the right of way was sold to the uh, to the state for six hundred forty thousand dollars plus some other odds and ends. And that right of way would eventually become incorporated into what we know today as the Overseas Highway. Um, of course, it would take several steps for it to become the road that we travel on today. But uh, in 1938, when this overseas highway reopened after the hurricane, it had become more, more, it become looking more like what it does today, where, it had a, a, where the ferry system had been eradicated, and now it was a solid, a solid road, a solid uh, road system. It was a toll road from 1938 to 1954, so there were toll booths, one at Lower Matacumbi Key, um, and then one again at Big Pine Key. Uh, but those, those tolls were lifted in 1954, and today uh, a lot of people wish those tolls would come back. Um, that's up for debate, and that's not what we're here to talk about, but it's, um, it's just another great slice of history, another great piece of Florida Keys history. And what we've done here is, uh, Tell a lot of it. So this is going to be our last talk until the first of the year. Uh, these Discover History program will come back after the first of the year. I will no longer be doing that, and I will have to say that Joe Miranda Baker, Aaron Dunn, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, and to all our, and to all our uh, followers. Thank you very much. <laughs>